All right, at this time we'll have our uh, opening uh, scripture reading. Brother Jarrell Mack will be reading that for us. It'll be, if things cooperate, on the screen before you. Brother Jarrell. This morning's scripture reading is taken from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 9. Now upon the first day of the week, Every very early in the morning, they came unto the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And they entered in and found not the body of, of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, We seek ye the living among the dead. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and, and, and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. You'll hear some prayer, Dr. Al. Bow with me as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. <clears throat> our gracious and Heavenly Father, have mercy on us all and hear our prayers, O Lord. Lord, bless this world and this country. Deliver us from this corona madness and give us what we need to endure and persevere through these times. Lord, we are so thankful for the love you have shown us by sending your only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. We thank you for this hope that came through Jesus Christ. We pray that we will seek first your kingdom we pray that we will continue to walk in the spirit. Lord, we pray for more laborers in your kingdom. Be with those that have erred away. We pray for their return. Give us strength and courage to do your will, to share the truth of the gospel to the lost. Give us, Lord, what we need to carry out this great commission. We pray, Lord, that we will have the love that we need to have for one another. Be with those mentioned on the, the sick list. Have mercy on them, Lord. Help them with their needs. Bless us all as we go through this service. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. We're singing the song, Lo, in the grave he lay, in preparation for the Lord's Supper. For those of you who are, uh, have a book, we'll be singing the three verses and then the chorus uh, after the third verse. Uh, 344, if you have a book. <coughs> It shouldn't be. It should. oh. 344, low in the grape he lay. Low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day. Jesus, my Lord, 
Bibles, open them to Romans chapter 5. We're going to read verses 6 through 11. While you're turning there, let me make a comment or two. As one enters the Garden of Gethsemane, even 2,000 years later, there's an awe about the place. There's some beautiful olive trees there. And when you're there, there'll be some little boys in there breaking off olive branches and trying to sell them to you for 10 cents apiece. But you, you come in and uh, off to the side, there's an overhang of rock, probably something like a cave. And then you go further out and there's some trees. And you, as you stand there, you realize that 2,000 years ago, thereabouts, Jesus had just eaten the Passover with his apostles and had instituted the Lord's Supper. And then he went to this garden and there he prayed. And we can imagine, and we don't really have to imagine, we can know what he did. He prayed, Father, if it be thy will, let this pass from me, let this cup pass from me. Nonetheless, he did go through with it. He said he would do it, and he did. And he did it for, uh, for you and for me. I think that's the thing that we have to look at. What we're going to do today is eat the Lord's Supper. And we're going to do, to do this remembering him, remembering his body, remembering his blood, remembering his sacrifice. Let's read the passage. For when we were yet, or when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received, now received the reconciliation. Remembering what took place in the garden, and what took place on the cross. Let's go to our Father in prayer and in thanksgiving. Our Father, we're thankful for this bread, which represents the body of your Son, the body of our Savior. As we partake of it, Father, let us, let our minds go back to that time and to the agony and the brutality that was done to this body or his body. And remember, Father, that it was done for us. And as we eat, let us remember, give thanks to him and remember his sacrifice and do it in a way that will be beneficial to us and pleasing to you. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let us now offer thanks for the fruit of the vine. Father, we're thankful for this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of your son. We're thankful, Father, that he was willing to come for our sakes, that his blood might cleanse us from all iniquities. As we take this, let us remember his sacrifice let our love overflow for him and for you. We pray that we'll take it in the way that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As mentioned before, we still have needs for our community, needs for our church, needs for upkeep of the building and all the other things which come with uh, being an organization. We'd ask that you consider uh, what you can give. Remember that, as I said earlier, that we are rewarded for, for what we do give. I'll read to you now Luke 6.38. says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. We've been richly blessed, and it's only proper for us to return some of those blessings. If you will, bow with me as we pray. Father God, we thank you for all the blessings you've given to us. We're mindful, Father, of this time of so many people who are not so richly blessed, and so many who are in need and need both physical and spiritual help. And at this time, Father, we're considering their, their physical well-being and our own. And we thank you, Father, that, that we are so blessed. And we ask that you would help us to see the, the ways in which we can share those blessings with others. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity we have to be together. We Thank you, Father, for your Son. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I understand that on Facebook our audio is not so good. We have a different setup this week, and I apologize for that. We'll try to make improvements next week. If you can't hear us, I, we apologize. Uh, we'll make improvements. We're going to sing number 434 for those of you who have books. Because He Lives, and we'll follow it with the refrain of, I know that my Redeemer lives. In the book, if you're following along, we'll sing verses one and three of the Cossie Lids. 
God sent his son, they call him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he knows the future. And life is worth because he lives, to remember him, to remember his death, to remember his resurrection, to remember his continuing life and work in his church today. If you were to make a, a list of the greatest days in the history of all mankind, of all the world, what would be on your list? The greatest days in the history of all of mankind. Think about what would be on your list. I had a friend yesterday. Well, I still have a friend today, but yesterday a friend of mine uh, got married on Facebook. Um, she was in quarantine um, and she, she got married. Uh, didn't even know she was getting married. I was just scrolling through Facebook and uh, there she was getting married. I think probably as she reflects upon that day, it will be one of the greatest days that she'll remember for the rest of her life. Marriages or the marriages always are. Watching my friend um, Zach Dundon with his firstborn child reminds me that while all babies are precious, that experience of the firstborn child is unforgettable. Well, all of them are unforgettable, but no one, everybody remembers, particularly the firstborn, I suppose, especially the mother uh, remembers that. And grandparents, uh, that day that you heard that your first grandchild, your first grandson or granddaughter was coming, it has to rank among the greatest days in all history, right? Great, uh, firstborn for all grandchildren are precious, but when we got that first news that we first became a grand, or we are first becoming a grandchild, a grandparent, it was significant. Just this week, uh, our family celebrated the 
birthday of our oldest granddaughter, 13, year, 13 years old. I'm not old enough to have a 13-year-old granddaughter, but I remember when that child was on the way and when that child came, it was among the greatest days in my life. Aside from those memorable days in our own personal lives, if you were to broaden the scope outside of your three score and 10, there are a lot of historical events and historical days that, that, stand, that stand out in our approximately 10,000 year history. So as you scope or pass the scope over the, the years of uh, human history, what days stand out? What days make that list? There's an author by the name of Nicholas Best. I don't know him or his work, but I read uh, a quote in his book called The Greatest Day in History. He writes, World War I did not end neatly with the Germans' surrender. After a dramatic week of negotiations, military offenses, and the beginning of a communist revolution, the German imperial regime collapsed. The Allies eventually granted an armistice to a new German government and at 11 o'clock on the 11th month, the 11th day of the 11th month, the guns officially ceased fire. But only after 11,000 more casualties had been sustained. And the London Daily Express proclaimed, it is the greatest day in history. And I imagine for the people who lived during that time, that was exactly right. For the people trying to get through the tragedy of war of that time, for that document to be signed, for that ceasefire to be declared, for that war to be over, it had to be, for their time, from their perspective, the greatest day in history. Different people from different times looking at life from different perspectives will come up with different answers. You'll have different answers than I. I'll have different answers than you. Than you. A soldier will look at it from a soldier's perspective, and he will see something what, like uh, Nicholas Best or the London Times saw, that that was the greatest day in history or a day like that. A doctor, on the other hand, might see the day that Louis Pasteur discovered the principles of vaccination and what we call pasteurization as being the greatest day in history, or at least one of the greatest days in history. He's not looking at wartime like a soldier is. As a Christian, you and I are given a different perspective. As we study the scriptures, we are given a different perspective of this world. We're given a different perspective of time. We're given a different perspective of, of this world and its history. It's a perspective given to us by God through the inspired authors of the Bible. And as I reflect upon the events that are recorded there in the Bible, there are so many, for lack of a better word, so many candidates for this title, the greatest day in human history. Take, for example, the, the very first day in human history or the first day of the world. That's pretty great, isn't it? when everything was beginning. I wasn't there like some of you might have been. <laughs> uh, some of you were, uh, well, you weren't there, but it reads in descriptive of that event, God created in the beginning, God created in the beginning of time, in the beginning of world history, God created the heavens and the earth. Wouldn't you love to have been there for that? to see those events taking place. I'm not sure uh, that when I get to heaven that I won't have more important things to do, more important things to think about. But as I was growing up as a kid, and even now in, in my thought process about heaven, I'm thinking that if I have opportunity, if I'm given opportunity, I'm going to ask God to do a replay up on the big screen of that week. I would love to see how it all took place. I've seen time-lapse photo, photos and videos uh, that people have uh, done that might represent what took place that day, but 
what a day it might be or what a event it might be to observe. The first day in world history, the whole week, first week of history. I googled Hubble telescope and I saw some of the pictures that thing has taken up there in space. And it's absolutely amazing just how big this universe is. And as I was looking at it, starting further, probing further into some of the photos, it's amazing just how small we are, not just we as humans, but even our planet, even our galaxy. We live in the Milky Way galaxy. And I'm sure in class and school, you considered or were told how big it is. According to what I've read, it's 53,000 light years across, 53,000 light years. When we think about the trillions of uh, dollars that are being spent that, uh, today for the uh, pandemic, 53,000 doesn't sound like a very large number. 53,000 light years, one light year is five trillion miles. 53,000 light years is 5 trillion miles times 53,000. I tried to write that out this morning. That's a bunch of zeros. I'll let you do the math as to how much it is because I can't do the math. Even more amazing, they've got pictures of the Milky Way. I don't know how they do it, but they've got pictures of the Milky Way that show the Milky Way as being the size of a pinhead when the scope is broadened and you see the billions of other stars and other galaxies that are out there. We're small. In comparison to some of those other galaxies, we're just itty bitty on the map. The psalmist surely had it right when he looked up into the created heavens and he sang, when I considered your works or your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? Why would you even consider us? Job had a similar thought when he says, what is man that you should exalt him, that you should set your heart on him? We're nothing compared to all the things that God has created. Just looking at the glories of the heavens, we're insignificant as a material being. But we're more than a material being, aren't we? The first day was followed by five more just like it, things popping into existence at just a word from God. He says, let there be trees, and boom, there's trees. Let there be animals, boom, and there's animals. And all of a sudden, the, 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 the world is filled with lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Snails, and creeping things, birds, bees. I don't know about you, but I would love to have walked the earth watching those huge dinosaurs do whatever it is that God created them to do. Maybe if I had one chasing me, I wouldn't love it so much, but <laughs> at least in my mind's eye, seeing those humongous beasts, we go to the zoo and we see elephants and we're impressed. Elephants are small compared to some of those dinosaurs that were there. But on that same day that God created those lions and tigers and bears and elephants and dinosaurs, God took a, a clot of dirt, clay, red clay, I imagine, from what I understand the word means. And he made a, a figurine into the shape of a human body, a clot of dirt. And he breathed into that piece of clay the breath of life. The Bible says he gave us a part of himself. He gave us a spirit, a spirit which will one day return to God. When this clot of dirt turns back into a clot of dirt, that spirit will return to God who gave it. Now, some folk have the heart of a fool. They deny the existence of God because, well, they don't want to submit to that God. They don't want to be in subjection to someone who is above them. They want to be number one in this life, in their life. 
the Bible says they're, they have the heart of a fool in denying what their heart knows to be true. I choose to believe that one of the greatest days in human history started when a loving, caring God said, let us make men in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, fish of the, sea the birds of the air, the cattle, over all the earth, over the creeping things that creeps on the earth. So God did. He created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created he them male and female. He created them. And then God blessed them. Listen to the blessing. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. I choose to believe that God purposely created the human race, and that he purposely created me. We are not an accident of nature. We are not a freak of nature. We are a purpose, purpose I can't say the word, purposefully created being in the image of God. And I choose to believe that his love for me is beyond my comprehension. It's, it's incredible. I choose to believe that he has great plans and purposes for my life and for your life, for our lives. I choose to believe that there's a home prepared where the saints abide, the song says, just over in glory land. And I choose to believe that before that day began, before in the beginning God created, God had already planned that you and I could be at his side eternally. Unlike the foolish, darkened, and deceived heart of the atheist, I know, I know that I am not an accident, a freak of nature. My life has design. My life has purpose. And I have a holy, supernatural being who, who cares deeply about me. And it makes me feel sad for the poor, deluded soul who chooses to believe he or she came from nothing, is the result of nothing, and has nothing to look forward to. There are other great days of which the Bible speaks, days among which I would rank as the greatest days in the history of mankind or humanity. There was a day, for example, that God spoke to Noah. You remember the story. It goes beyond or before chapter 6 of Genesis, but the story Noah is brought into the framework in Genesis chapter 6. The Bible shows us that even though God did have such great love for humanity, such great plans for humanity, he desired that humanity would be with him eternally. He also gave those humans the opportunity to choose what they would do. He's not going to force us to be in his fellowship. He's not going to force us to be his companions. He gave us the choice to do what we would want to do. And as a result, in the beginning, humans made the choice to free themselves of, of God and to, to write out life on their own. They were deceived. They had the truth. They had the opportunity to be in fellowship with God. They were in fellowship with God. They knew what that was like. But then they, they were deceived into believing you don't need God's help. They were told that God's just holding back on you. He's not showing you everything that you can do or everything that you become. And so rather than trusting God, they trusted the lie and the liar. And from that day forward, man chased his faulty vision of freedom, walking away from God. In the process of doing so, the further he got away from God, the more he forgot about what love is. See, God is love. You walk away from God, you walk away from what love is. In doing so, he became self-serving rather than self-sacrificing. He became 
greedy rather than generous. He became unloving. And these characteristics breed hatred and, and violence rather than love and mercy. And so when we come to Genesis chapter 6, people walking away from God for, I don't know, two, three, four thousand 4,000 years, we have a, a society which is so corrupt that God said every thought, every imagination of their heart was evil, and it was evil continually. And God said that if he allowed this to continue, if he allowed them just to do as they were doing, they would destroy themselves. There would be no human left. All humans would destroy all humans, and then God's creation would have been in vain. So God found a man whom he believed, still believed in God, and he called upon that man, his name is Noah, he called upon that man to build a boat. And God said, I'm going to bring a flood upon all the earth, destroy all living things. And through Noah, the, the Spirit of Christ preached and invited all who would come to live in that boat with God. And after 120 years of inviting humanity to come and live with God rather than die, only eight souls came, Noah and his family. And as promised, God saved those eight souls from the flood. And I see that as a great day because if God had not cared, if God were just that God that was up there somewhere and he started the top spinning and now he's just watching to see what's going to happen, if he didn't care, God would not have spoken to Noah. And if God had not spoken to Noah, none of us would be here today. This story to me shows, yes, God is a God of judgment, but he's not mean. He's not vindictive. He was a God of judgment for the purpose of saving those who want to be saved. He was bringing judgment because they were destroying themselves. So he brought judgment in order to save those who would be saved. And this story tells us of the love and mercy of God that's mixed with his judgment. The story is not about those who thumb their noses at God. It's about a God who wanted to save them. A great day. An unfortunate day for the lost, but it's a great day because we can be here today because of it. And what about that day that God split the Red Sea? Again, I won't lie to you. This is one of my favorite days in all of history. As far as the records of the Bible are concerned, this is one of my favorite days. And I know it's about more than God splitting the Red Sea, but I sure would have liked to have been there. But Charlton Heston just doesn't do it justice. I would love to, and all the videography that Hollywood did, I would love to have been there to see it actually take place. It wasn't just that miracle. There were a lot of miracles, but just... To, to walk there on the bottom of that sea. I don't know if they could see marine life in the sea on either side of them. I don't know, but I'd like to think that they could. I, I, I've been to the Atlanta Aquarium. I've seen, you know, the, in that tunnel that they have there, I've seen the, the marine life on top of me, on either side of me, and it, it's, it's just amazing. Think about walking through the Red Sea as it's being held up by two or by a great east wind and walking through that sea. It must have been amazing. There's a lot more going on here than a spectacular miracle. Again, this is an act of God's saving grace. God was saving this family, this Jewish family, this Jewish family that had become a nation of people. They were treated as slaves in Egypt, and he was saving them from that torment, saving them from that torture, saving them from that sure death, because he was going to use this family, this nation, as he had promised their forefather Abraham to bring Messiah into the world, to save not just that family, but to save the world. The one whom God had appointed to be Messiah would come through this nation that he saved that day in that seat. For thousands of years, God had been preparing 
the world for salvation. When he created in the beginning, when he created us, humanity, we were perfect, we were pure, but when we believe the lie and the liar rather than trusting God and, and, and love, God's love, and maintaining his fellowship, we needed to be rescued. We put ourselves in jeopardy, and we needed to be rescued from the consequences of that decision. We couldn't save ourselves. Once we separated ourselves from God because we've been tainted with sin, we can't make our way back. You know, in a lot of movies, you've seen them, someone or a group of someones will make a foolish or stupid decision, and that decision or the, the consequences of that decision will, will, will come back on them. They're seeking wealth, they're seeking fame, they're seeking power, and so they make this decision to do such a thing, but then it'll, it'll come back on them. You see it in all the movies, right? Ramifications or the consequences uh, are always bad things that come back on them. Dinosaurs come back to life and start eating people. Volcanoes start erupting and earthquakes start to happen and the earth's going to break apart, killing all life. Wars and rumors of war start and curable diseases spread. Zombies come to life. All because of a foolish decision that someone or someone's made. You name it and Hollywood can picture it for you. But in the movie, finally, generally speaking, just in the nick of time, someone, some hero comes along with a plan. He or she finds a way to reverse or to stop the effects, beat up the bad guys and save all the people that are left. Well, the Bible is no science fiction thriller, but it is the story of a God rescuing us from the consequences of our decision. Our decision to violate our spiritual nature, to seek fame and fortune and power through physical lust. The Red Sea that we were talking about, that event was part of that salvation. It wasn't just a big miracle of God holding back the sea. It was a step in the direction of making a way for you and me to come home to God. And that's why, in my opinion anyway, it ranks up there with one of the greatest days in human history. And there are so many days like that that we could go through the scriptures and look at. The Bible tells us over and over that there are great events taking place in all for our salvation. They were not just great miraculous things that took place, but they were steps on the way to make it possible for you and I to live with God eternally. And we could spend the day, months in fact, in amazement talking about these days. To make a long story short, however, I want to skip forward about a thousand years after the Red Sea event. It's a familiar uh, event to you likely. You may not know the dating of it, but it's about a thousand years, give or take a few hundred, uh, after uh, the Red Sea. It's recorded in the Bible as an event that was predictive of the greatest day in all of human history. One great day predicting the greatest day. And you'll find the story in the book of Daniel, chapter 2. We're not going to read all of it, but I do hope that we'll get the gist of it. Basically, a very powerful pagan king had a dream. God was speaking to a pagan king. Maybe he dreamed this dream several times and it was bothering him. Maybe he only dreamed it one time, but it was bothering him. In either case, he was bothered by this dream, but he couldn't remember neither the, the dream nor its interpretation. It was a dream from God. It was about the future, but the king <coughs> couldn't even remember it to tell his interpreters what to do. So the old pagan king commanded his witches and sorcerers, you will not only reveal to me the dream, but its interpretation, else I will destroy you and your families. Well, that put them all in a dither because they couldn't you know, give us a dream. We can give you an interpretation. He knew that. He's accustomed to their ways. But he says, you give me the dream and its interpretation and their pretty concerned about that. And God 
in his usual way of showing that the ways of men are not the ways of God, the ways of God are not the ways of men, he sent a boy, a boy named Daniel, to the old pagan king to tell him both the dream and its interpretation. We find that here in Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. You, O king, you are watching and behold a great image. The great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. Verse 32, this image, uh, head, the image's head was of fine gold, its chest of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Daniel went on to tell him the interpretation. He said, O king, you are that head of gold. You and your kingdom represent that head of gold or are represented by the head of gold on that image. You're glorious. You're, you're beautiful. You're one of the greatest kingdoms that ever existed, but one day your kingdom is going to come to an end. There's going to be another kingdom represented by the chest uh, and arms of, of silver. And by world history terms, we know that this represents the Persian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire that came and overtook Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. But Nebuchadnezzar was dead by that time. Again, this, this second kingdom was, was glorious and beautiful, not as much as the golden head, but it was still glorious and, and, and beautiful. And he said, Daniel did, he says, even that kingdom, however, will one day come to an end. Then he speaks of that kingdom of bronze, the belly and thighs of bronze, very strong, powerful metal, not as glorious as the silver, not as glorious as the gold, not beautiful like that, but it was strong, it was powerful, it was the kingdom of the Greeks, according to world history. As strong as it was, however, Daniel says, it will not last. Another kingdom will come. The iron kingdom, the iron-legged kingdom, with feet of iron and clay, it had a weakness. But it would come and it would overtake the Greeks. Again, you and I can open up our history books and we can see this take place. It, in our history books, it's not called the kingdom of gold, the kingdom of silver, the kingdom of uh, bronze or iron. But we can see these things taking place. We have the benefit of history to show that to us. Daniel was looking into the future. Actually, Nebuchadnezzar was being shown the future and, and Daniel was telling him what it was. And Daniel came to the point God's point of giving him the dream, which is greater than world history. Listen to what he said. You watched, Nebuchadnezzar, verse 34, while a stone was cut out without hands. You watched as it, as it struck that image, the iron, bronze, silver, gold image. It struck the, the feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were all crushed together and became like chaff from the summer went threshing floors. They went and carried them away and no trace was found of them. And the stone that was cut out without hands that struck the image, it became a great mountain and it filled the whole earth. Daniel's interpretation of this is, is very important to our understanding of the greatest event, the greatest day in the history of mankind. Let's read it. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Here's the interpretation. Listen to it. And in the days of these kings, now some people say it's the iron kings, the Roman kings. Some people say it's the days of all the kings together. And those days when earthly kingdoms were taken over the world. I'm going to go with the iron kings because that seems to be the context. But anyway, in the days of these kings, these earthly kinds of kings, these earthly kinds of kingdoms, gold, silver, bronze, iron, doesn't matter. In those days, the God of heaven, he will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That stone that crushed all of those, that crushed that image, became the mountain it is the kingdom that God will set up, and the kingdom shall not be left to another people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand, what's the word, forever. The gold, it will come to an end. The silver kingdom, it will come to an end. The bronze kingdom, it will come to an end. The Roman kingdom, it will come to an end. This kingdom will stand forever. This kingdom would not be like other kingdoms built by men. This one would be cut out by God himself. This kingdom would not be like the kingdoms of man coming to an end. It will stand forever. 
This is a prediction of the greatest day in the history of mankind, and it was given 500 years approximately before that day happened. And if you continue to read in the book of Daniel, you'll find that he predicted in some very clear, detailed uh, messages the coming of Messiah. Messiah simply means appointed one, anointed one, the one God anointed or appointed to do a task. We know him as Jesus, who is Messiah, or Jesus, who is Christ. It's the same word, different language. But Daniel predicts his coming. He predicts his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And it's amazing when you read it, considering that it was written 500 years aforetime, how exact his predictions were. God is making it clear through Daniel before Christ Messiah came that it's all a part of his plan. I'm in control. I'm working in the affairs of men to bring this about. This is all part of my plan. What plan? My plan to save you, save humanity from the consequences of, those, of their sinful decision to think that they could live without God. In Daniel chapter 7, it's recorded that Daniel himself had a dream. This is not Nebuchadnezzar dreaming this time. It's Daniel, the prophet, dreaming. and He's recording that dream. He says in verse 13, I watched, or I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man was coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, if you move forward about 500 years, you come to Acts chapter 1. We're in the time that Jesus of Nazareth has been crucified and has been resurrected. He's, he, he died, was buried, and has been resurrected. And he spent, after his resurrection, about a month with his disciples, proving to them, helping them to comprehend that he is alive. He's not dead. Yes, they saw him die up on the cross. Yes, they saw him be placed in the tomb. But he, I am alive, he says. I have been by the power of God resurrected. And at the end of that 40 days, 40-something days, just outside the city of Jerusalem while speaking with his disciples, we have Luke's record of Jesus ascending back to the heavens while the disciples watched. And Luke points out that he ascended with the clouds of heaven. Watch what Daniel says when he's looking into the future of this event. He's 500 years before what we just talked about before the ascension of Jesus, listen to what Daniel says. He, Jesus, the one who would be Jesus when he comes, came to the ancient of days, the ancient of days being God, and they brought him near before him. Then to him, to Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that all peoples, nations, and languages, that's you and me, a peoples of all uh, nations and languages should be able to serve him. His dominion is everlasting. It shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Because of their sins, for thousands of years, humanity had no access to God, no ability to come before him because they were tainted with sin. They had become defiled. And that's what God says in Genesis chapter uh, 2 to, the, to, to man. He says, when you sin, you separate yourself from me. I can't be with you anymore. I'm holy. You've become unholy, and we cannot have communion anymore. So for thousands of years, they, humanity and God had been separated. Now, because Jesus has paid our penalty, death was the penalty. You sin, you die, you're separated from God. Jesus said, I, or Jesus came, and he paid our penalty. And then God, because Jesus was perfect and innocent, not guilty, God raised him from the dead. And Jesus then was taken to heaven to sit on God's right hand to rule in God's kingdom. And brothers and sisters, friends, because Jesus reigns, we can be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ shed on that cross. 
because Jesus reigns, because he has been resurrected and now ascended to the throne of God, the guilt of our sins will no longer keep us away from the Holy God if we come to him. And this is what God has been planning all along. From the time of in the beginning God created, God has been planning this. He knew Jesus would be the way home for us. He planned that Jesus would be the way home for us. He has always wanted us to have a way home to be with him. That's why he created us, so that we could be with him. The greatest day in the history of mankind was the day God, through Jesus Christ, opened the doors of the kingdom of heaven. In relation to that, I want you to read with me in the book of Acts. Listen to what Peter says about that day. Acts chapter 2, verse 16. But this, what you're seeing, the miracles of the day of Pentecost, the apostles uh, preaching and teaching in, in, in tongues, all of this, he says, and more, is that which was spoken by the prophet, prophet Joel. He said, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then he speaks to us. He says, hear these words, verse 22. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you, confirmed to you by God, by his miracles, by wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know you saw. Him, Jesus, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by lawless hands have crucified and put to death, whom God has raised up. The one you put to death with lawless hands, God has raised him up, having loosed the pains of death, because it is not possible that he should be held by it. Why? Because he is God. Verse 30 says, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. Verse 31, this he spoke concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ, of the Christ, that his soul would not be left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus, verse 32, God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. We, the apostles, have seen this, and we now testify to you of it. Verse 36, therefore, know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus whom you have crucified, what? Lord and Christ. Why? Why did God do this? Why did God let him die? Why did God bring him back from the grave? Why did God put him on the throne in heaven? Well, it's so that we could have Easter bunnies on Easter Sunday, right? It's so that we could have Easter eggs on Easter Sunday. It's so that we could come to church once a year with our Easter clothes, our Easter bonnet. No, 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 a thousand times, no. This was done so that you could come home. This was done so that you could have the opportunity to repent of your sins. This was done so that you and I could be washed in the blood of Christ in baptism for the remission of our sins. This was done so that when your life leaves this body, this clot of dirt, it can one day go home and be with God. That's what God wanted from before the beginning. The greatest day in the history of mankind. It's the day that God opened the doors of heaven, allowed sinners to be cleansed by the blood of his only begotten son and to be added to his church, his kingdom that shall never be destroyed. And some people say that, well, the church is just a man-made thing in order to control people religiously. Those people are deceived and foolish. That's what some churches have done. I'll not deny that. The denominational world is guilty as sin of that. But the church of our Lord Jesus Christ is not a man-made institution. It is a human or it is a living organism 
created by God and given its life by God. And it cannot be destroyed. The greatest day in human history. It's not about Easter Sunday. It's not about Christmas morning. It's about what God did to give you eternal life. If you're listening to us today and you're not a Christian, not a child of God, not a part of that kingdom, chasing the things of this world, we want to give you an opportunity to know more about this kingdom. God has created this kingdom into which God wants to add you, or part of it that God wants to add you to. The Bible from kibber to kibber, they say, is about that kingdom about what God did to bring that kingdom into existence, about the sacrifice that he made so that you can regain fellowship with him. If you're not faithful to that kingdom, walking in the light as he is in the light, make that right with your God. If you're not yet a part of that kingdom, give us a call. 770-457-9696 is the church's number. Give us a call. Let us open the scriptures with you and show you what God has done. Let's uh, conclude with a song. In your books it is 345, if you have books. Sing it. I know you're all muted on the, uh, the uh, um, video. Because if we don't mute you, then it becomes chaos. It becomes really a, it may be a joyful noise, but it's really a noise from what our experience was the first week when we tried that. So you'll sing at home, but sing with enthusiasm. Read the words that you're singing. It'll be on the screen before you sing those words with a passion. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, Hallelujah. Raise your voice and try and stay. Hallelujah. See the heavens, the earth reply. Hallelujah. Before you sing that second verse, we'll see if I can take it down about 16 octaves. Probably can't. Love's redeeming work is done, hallelujah. Fraught with fight, the battle's won, hallelujah. Death in vain, for it's his rise, hallelujah. Christ has opened paradise, hallelujah. Lives again, our glorious King, hallelujah. Where, O oh, death, is now thy sting, hallelujah. Once he died, our souls to save, Where's thy victory boasting great? Hallelujah. I can get Bob Whitlock to lead us in a word of prayer and we'll close our services. Okay, let's let's pray together. <clears throat> our Father in heaven, we once again come before your throne, thankful for this opportunity and these means that we have to to gather together to offer our praise to you and, and, and worship you. Father, we pray that you, you would be with those that were mentioned earlier as, as being sick or recovering from surgeries and that need your uh, blessings of healing. We pray that you would be with them and those that are caring for them. Father, we pray that you would be for those that are suffering from the from this pandemic that, that have contracted the disease. We, we pray that you would be with them and heal them as well. We pray that you would be with those that have lost family members pray that you would uh, provide comfort for them. Father, we pray that you would be with our leaders at, at all levels, that, that they would look to you for guidance and would make wise decisions during this time to get us safely through this crisis. Father, we pray that you would be with each and every one of us and, and keep us safe and that we would all 
stay home and, 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 and follow the guidance that we have been given. Please be with us now and, and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.